And hey everyone, my name is Rachel DeRosier, and I'm a relatively new board member. I assist with the guest speakers and also with the field trips. Um, to this Saturday's field trip is to the Lemon Creek Wildflower Preserve with the Lemon Bay Conservancy. Uh, it is full right now. It filled up pretty quickly. But uh, if we do have any cancellations, perhaps we can send out another e-newsletter saying, hey, we've got some openings. So if that happens, that sounds like something we could maybe do. Uh, but again, right now we are full, uh, but we are looking forward to a really good day Saturday. And it is also my pleasure to introduce Kate to everybody. Kate Porduez is a self-described adult onset naturalist. She's a transplant from coastal Maine, and she's trained as a Florida master naturalist and as a nationally certified interpretive guide. Following a lifelong long distance love affair with nature, Kate is delighted to be living the life of a naturalist full time. Kate gives frequent walks and talks in Charlotte and Sarasota counties with a specific focus on scrub habitat and the endangered Florida scrub jay. As a naturalist and guide, Kate is committed to sharing with others the hidden wonders of nature all around us. And she was the recipient of Sarasota County Parks Volunteer of the Year Award in 2018. Kate gives walks and talks for a number of organizations, including several Audubon chapters and the Mangrove chapter of Native Plant Society, as well as Sarasota Libraries. So please, Kate, we're ready for you. Okay, now this is the, the once I start talking, it's going to be home free. Getting the screen shared. 21 people. <laughs> Um, let me get rid of this. Insects. Bear with me, people. 24 people. Oh, okay. So I'm taking you all out. I don't know if you need to see me. Does anybody need to see me? I hope not. Um, I've taken you all down. So Thank you for your interest in insects. This uh, was another uh, commission from Venice Area Audubon. In fact, I was asked to do a program about the insect apocalypse. I said, sure, I can do that. And so last summer, I, I tend to make my program from Maine in the summer. I realized I couldn't talk about the insect apocalypse without first talking about insects. And so that's why this is called part one. And let's see. There's a, okay, we're having a little trouble here. There we go. I do you know how to, there's something on my screen that I want to get rid of. More? No, I'm just going to have to put up with that toolbar. So I apologize for the distraction. So anyway, so part two is going to be the death of a thousand cuts. Um, the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, came out with this issue about a year ago that declined measures for a number of, of um, measures that insects are in serious decline. And as I say, that's something that I hope to, I will enjoy it, but I'll, I'll put that program together next summer. So why do we care about insects? Because they run the world. And if this you can read yourself, but if mankind, mankind were to disappear, the world would regenerate back to the rich state of equilibrium. If insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse into chaos. And it would do it in a few weeks. It wouldn't take years and years. It, would, it wouldn't be like there's an earlier extinction. Insects run the world. So why are they so important? Well, there are a number of reasons, and we're going to look at these individually. They're important because they're miracles of evolution. There are just a whole ton of them, whether sure, the number of species, the number of the amount of biomass, however you look at it, they're just a whole lot of insects. They are key players in the food web, both as the primary consumers and the tritivores. So they really keep our trophic transfer conveyor belts in motion. 
they perform amazing services for the for the world but also many are exploited by humans we'll look at that and then we're going to take a look at the use social insects use social is like the, the the super organisms the ones that gave darwin such a headache because it didn't the whole theory of natural selection didn't work with this kind of community of insects. And he really did make his peace with it toward the end. So that's what we're going to kind of look at the questions we're going to answer. But the first thing we're going to say, ask ourselves is what is an insect? Now we probably think we know this and we do know this, but it's worth reviewing. This of course is not an insect but I just love this picture. I have no other way to slip it into a presentation, but here. So insects are part of the phylum Arthropoda, jointed feet. Um, there are a number of uh, classes, subphylum and classes, some extinct um, within the class of insecta. Uh, the, not all of them are listed here, but the, the, main, um, the main orders are listed and there are an awful lot of a lot of them. So insecta, it comes from Latin insecare, Latin to cut into. And there are many sections too. We think that we're going to look at the three main body parts, which we're all familiar with, the head, the thorax, the ex, and abdomen. It's what we all are taught. But in fact, there's a many sections fused into those three minor body parts, major body parts. And within that uh, format, there's tremendous variability. The head, for example, the eyes are variable, can be on a number of different locations. They're, used, they're always two antennae, but they're varied. They're structured, they're structurally segmented. But it gets really crazy when you get the mouth parts, particularly some insect lives, the adult lifespan is so short they don't have digestive systems. They don't have mouth parts. They're not going to live long enough to eat. But this is an example over on the right, some examples of the major types of insect mouth parts. So that's the head. It's really about the senses, uh, sensing um, uh, chemicals. They don't have a sense of smell like we understand it. And they certainly don't hear like we understand it. But getting their information through their antenna. So the insect body, the remaining two parts, the thorax and the abdomen in this illustration shows you a lot uh, more clearly how many uh, sections have been fused uh, to create these two sections. The thorax is about um, locomotion. And this is where the legs and the wings, if there are wings, if it is a winged insect, will attach. And then the abdomen is about digestion and reproduction. And we know they don't uh, uh, respire like we do, but have these little spiracles along the head and, and the sides of their thorax and abdomen. And that is um, how they do exchange gases. And there's some flexibility. So there's some movement within this. It's not just hard case like a coffin. There is some kind of movement within there. So any questions about, well, I can't ask you that because this is not live. If you have any questions about the basics of insects, uh, put it in the chat room and we'll get back to it. Um, once again, I'm just trying to fiddle with getting things. Half my screen is taken up with menu bars. Nobody likes a whiner. Okay, so why are they so important? Miracle of evolution. This is the best um, description I could come across. James Truman, his essay, The Evolution of Insect Metamorphosis, that turned um, small obscure soil arthropods into a dominant terrestrial group that has profoundly shaped the evolution of terrestrial life. And they've done that through the power of metamorphosis. And metamorphosis is not one thing. And insects do not metamorphose in exactly the same way. So there are some like the springtail on the left, some of the earliest insects uh, never changed for 400 million years. 
no metamorphosis. In complete metamorphosis, where there's no pupil phase, and there's complete metamorphosis. And we're going to look at those three and the advantages and disadvantages of each of those uh, lifestyles. So let's see, get this up here. So Arthropods, they first appear at 500 million years ago, part of the Cambrian explosion. And the best record we have for that is from the Burgess Shale. Um, and you can see, I like hallucinogenia. Can't you just love these? Um, so these were some very strange looking animals. The Burgess Shale, for anybody who is not aware of it, there was a, um, a very a silt like avalanche that just um, sm suffocated, smothered, and then uh, fossilized in wonderful detail these early, uh, these Cambrian arthropods. So about 400 million years ago, after being in the, in the murky ocean, they take to land. And once these arthropods that will become insects take to land, they start making changes. And that's how insects evolve. Silverfish and springtails were the first to evolve. And they really haven't changed much at all. This is a metabolist development. They're insects. They've got six legs. There are the hexapods. They've got six legs. But once the egg is hatched, that first nymph is just a miniature of the adult that it will turn. And it will go through different instars. It will shed its, um, its exoskeleton. And it will become a breeding adult. But it will never really change. Uh, one of the disadvantages of this is that the, the young uh, the, the early nymphs and the adults are uh, after the same resource. They're competing. The young and the adults are competing. The advantage of it is that it doesn't take a whole lot of highly evolved um, uh, uh, strategies. So heavy metabolists are incomplete metamorphosis. This is a little different. It comes in a couple of different ways. Now, the, the two that I've used for examples are the dragonfly, where the larva is uh, aquatic. It continues. This is this nice larval uh, exoskeleton. And it is. it will crawl out when it's time to molt, and it will become terrestrial airborne. And it will uh, arrive with its wings in full. The larvae and the adults are not competing for resources. Um, one of my trick questions is, what is the most uh, successful predator in the world? The answer to that is the dragonfly. They have a 95% hit rate, and that's true both as larvae and as adults. So in this case, they're not competing. It's a pretty simple transition. This is a little more like the silverfish, where the, the first instar, the eggs hatch, that first instar is very similar. You can see very similar to the adult. It doesn't have all of the features like the silverfish. This, each instar will get a little more adult develop, development, particularly in and around wings. And so by the time it goes through its maturation and has wings, um, it has gone through some significant changes. The problem with this uh, style of metamorphosis is that the adults and the, the lower instars, earlier instars, are definitely in competition for the same resource. So eventually, complete metamorphosis evolves. And that takes quite a bit longer to develop. And the comparison is that you have the pupil phase, where you have here the incomplete. Uh, hemimetabolus, eggs, nymphs, 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 adults. Here we go through the larval phase and the pupa, and then the pupa cracks open and we have an adult. So here, the adult and the larva, or we often refer to them as caterpillars or maggots or some such, they are definitely not competing for the same materials. And so it's so, it's so successful 
that 85% of in insects undergo complete metamorphosis. So this is an example of the, uh, the larva are consuming the primary consumers of uh, the, the newly transformed energy into matter. They're, trans they're consuming that versus the, the, uh, the adult that is after nectar. So they're not competing at all. Um, the you can see from the fossils and the current and the and the photographs of living or well, they're probably dead, but you know the current organisms. These these um, life forms and styles developed very early and then didn't change. You know the fake eye or you know this that it, once it was established and successful, very little changed except for we will mention some of the changes. So we're, we're all of a generation to remember Buckminster Fuller, who was, I should have done a little more zoology, not all that engineering. He was convinced there's nothing in the caterpillar that tells you it's going to be a butterfly. Well, he uh, was quite wrong. Jan Schwammerdam, who was a, a Dutch physician who hated practicing medicine and only ever saw patients to get enough money so that he could go back to his zoological studies. And these are his dates, not along with me. And he, may, he challenged two prevailing wisdoms. One is that insects were beneath God's notice, that God had far more interesting things to do managing the archangels and angels and kings and, and, uh, and so forth, that the insects could only have uh, been generated by spontaneous generation, somehow springing from the earth. And the other thing he challenged successfully was um, Aristotle had uh, presented the idea of metamorphosis, but he had it quite wrong. He felt that one species would transform itself into another. His famous argument was that a red start would go off on migration, although they didn't know where they went, and would come back as a robin. So that, that was how metamorphosis was understood that species transformed one to the other. Swammerdam said no, that that is not how it works, that, that, that different life phases look completely different. And he was able to prove that, prove that the egg, larva, pupa, and adult were stages of the same animal. And he did it with a good microscope and imaginal discs. It sounds like a little like imagination, right? And Imago is the term for the adults. You know, you have the egg, the larva, the pupa, then we say adults. Well, imago is adult. And under the microscope, he was able to show that the little discs corresponded to the features of an adult. So when you're a caterpillar, your hormones are saying, feed, 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 fat, 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 fat. And at a certain point, those hormones switch and they basically say, okay, now all the hormone instructions are going to the imaginal discs and it's like grow, 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 grow. And that's what's happening during the pupation period. So all of the pieces of the adults are in existence within the, um, within the larval form. So what they did was, in, was involved wings and flights. And this takes uh, another little story here. During the Devonian Carboniferous periods, this is in the earlier phases, they, uh, the oxygen level was so high that uh, the insects became really huge because they didn't have any predators either other than each other. But why select the flight? These are the answers. They could uh, reach more prey, avoid predation, a larger breeding pool, greater dispersal, and they co-evolve with angiosperms. So uh, there's a lot of, so they're getting more in terms of nutrition, both as larvae and as adults. And so uh, selecting for flight made a whole lot of sense. And no other creature could fly, so they had global dominance for maybe 150 years. But the one difference between, and you're going to say, well, other things fly, but insects are entirely different because their wings were not adapted hands. Wings 
evolve as wings. So the first little guy, this little swimmer guy, he's got little nubbins. And as he jumps, his little nubbins kind of give him a little more um, tr traction in the air. He, he can fly, he can uh, soar a little farther. So those with little nubbins on their backs have bigger nubbins. And then it goes on and on and on. And by eventually, those they're selecting for the larger nubbins, which now have become wings and flight as achieved. And of course, that didn't happen overnight, but it happened sequentially. And it definitely happened across a number of species. Now, the other, just to digress slightly, because who doesn't love uh, talking about pterosaurs? The other times that flight evolved, it evolved as modified hands. And that's true of the pterosaurs. It's certainly true of birds. Um, it took they it took a while. They got flight about uh, the avian dinosaurs got flight about 150 million years. So they had 90 million years of flight before the major extinction. And the most recent were bats. And of course, you can look, you can just see the hand, the fingers, everything is there. Around the time that the avian dinosaurs evolved in, in flight they became insect predators. They could fly and chase insects and the selective pressure um, resulted in insects becoming smaller and smaller for increased maneuverability. So that was why they've in their miracles of evolution. Why are insects so important? Well, there are a whole lot of them and I don't really want to waste our time analyzing pie charts. You get the idea. However you look at it, they're, they're just, we are outweighed, the biomass of insects outweighs, you hear different things, certainly it's all people put together, whether it's all, all other animal life put together, I, whatever it is, it's a whole lot. And every, every pie chart you find tells you the same thing. So of the arthropods, um, we've got, they're dominated by the beetles, the wasps, and flies with spiders in their suits. Uh, but beetles particularly, I also God must have really loved them because he made so many. What's really, I, I prefer to draw your attention to is the wondrous forms and colors, like this praying mantis, this gorgeous eagle, these uh, hemeptera, these true bugs, um, just beautiful, the leaf hopper, just this beautiful little ladybug beetle. When it comes to size, it's hard to overstate the range. So on one side, we have the fairy wasp, Tinkerbell and Anarchy, uh, just slightly more than a tenth of a millimeter. This is a barely microscopic wasp. Now she's going to be a wasp. She's got to do all the things that wasps do. Uh, they're carnivores. They got to, she's got to uh, find and eat meat and she's got to feed it to her, uh, her wasplet. And at a scale that's quite hard to imagine versus the stick insect on the right hand side, 24 inches of stick insect and three and a half ounces of African beetle, the name of which now escapes me. There's also tremendous variety in lifespans. The, the termite queen, there are often more than one termite queen in the colony. She can live as much as 50 years where an adult mayfly is living only long enough to mate and lay eggs. Very brief. Um, my sense, and I'm not, I'm not an entomologist, I can't say this for sure, but my, my spidey senses tell me that the dominant life form for insects is the larval phase. It seems to be longer. It's where they have the most impact on the environment. So the third reason they are so important is they are key to the food web. And they do this in two important ways. They're the primary consumers. Uh, we <laughs> use them here. They're the ones who eat the insects. And then when anything dies, they are among those uh, the difference between a decomposer and a detritivore. A detritivore has a gullet. So insects are detritivores. Decomposers would be 
uh, like fungi and things and uh, similar. No, there are no similar, but they're just fungi. So we know the story, we're plant people, uh, the miracle of photosynthesis turning energy into matter. Uh, it's not a terribly concentrated energy. I just read recently, and Tom, you may already know this, that it takes 150 separate chemical steps uh, for photosynthesis to, uh, to co complete the cycle of, tr of uh, transforming light energy into matter. And of course, we'll release, we'll release some oxygen. And so this is where that, uh, the, the primary producers all this vegetation is not going to um, get a lot of animals fed. And that's why it becomes more and more con condensed with each uh, level of the trophic pyramid. And then of course, as the detritivores come in at the end. So one end would be larva eats fresh leaves. Uh, hard to think of these little squiggly bits as predators, but they are. Everything wants to eat and nothing wants to be eaten. So uh, the plants work out defense mechanisms. And there are two kinds of defense me mechanisms. Um, this hepti uh, the, um, the peptide signaling, so they're, they're, they're having sufficient numbers of, of amounts of toxicity um, that most animals can't work around it. Now we know the first that example milkweed and monarchs. And the second is to uh, attract, so let's do them one at a time. So we have this, and so uh, toxins as defense, uh, they, uh, they can be worked around. And in fact, in the case of the monarchs, they're sequestered as defense against birds. Now it doesn't kill a bird because that's not how you learn the lesson. Makes the bird really sick and won't eat that again. So the leaf flagging uh, is another way to limit the toxin. So then the parasitoid attraction, the plant will put out a, a volatile organic compounds. Whatever is eating it will bring in uh, its parasite. And uh, this is, it's, it's not overnight, but this is one of the ways that um, parasites and predators can be an elegant control. So we have, I don't even remember why that picture's in there. That's, um, so Tom, is this sign from, from Sweet Bay or one very much like it uh, that not doesn't belong in the garden? Uh, currently, there's a lot of talk about keystone species, um, the, those plants that can host numerous uh, uh, Lepidopter, little inchworm species, oaks being uh, lapping the field, so to speak, just as a work of um, Doug Calamy, the work of Doug Calamy. Uh, so now there's a lot of interest in putting in keystone species that can support the most, uh, the most uh, species and not miss a few thousand leaves. And oaks are the plants to go to. So when we, those of us in butterfly societies, it's, it's always tempting to focus on the charismatic species, but we really don't want, that's not the focus here. We want these little, you know, the, anybody got the book, uh, Moths of Eastern North America, you flip through the colored pages. Well, first of all, there aren't very many colors. They're all gray and they all look the same size. They have five dots, seven dots, 11 dots, whatever. We want these little anonymous caterpillars. And this is why. Calamy had a nest cam. He counted a pair of chickadees and three eggs and three nestlings. And over the course of two weeks, the chickadee adult, black-capped chickadee, provided those nestlings with 9,000 caterpillars. Now they shared them at 3,000 each. They still have to feed themselves. They're gonna feed them for another two weeks once they're fledged. And they're not going to fly very far to do it. So they need that resource needs to be concentrated. And oaks and pines, too, are great trees. If you can only plant one or two things um, and you want to support birds, oaks are your tree. And that's what the birds are, are feeding to their young. 
So we have on one end, we have uh, the, the primary consumer, but then they're the, um, the ultimate consumer because they're going to be chawing on dead wood. But they can't do this without some help because um, the lignin, the cellulose, this is hardly digestible for a little fat uh, beetle. So they have a partner. So fungus, what does a fungus want? A fungus wants carbon. And so we have two types of fungus. We have the saprophytic, I hope I said that right, that just sort of, uh, it's hyphae go in and it breaks down. Uh, they extrude enzymes outside of the hyphae. Uh, the, um, these enzymes break down the wood, extracts the carbon, which is then absorbed back into the body. So it's external digestion. It's outside of the corpus of the fungus. So when the, um, when the beetle lays her eggs and her, her little maggoty uh, uh, offspring want to chew it, they actually can't break down the, uh, the, the lignin and the cellulose. So, so she lays eggs that are covered with a fungal layer. So while the egg is getting ready to hatch, Let's see if we can go back to that. These, this fungus is coming out and breaking down the cellulose and the lignin so that what it leaves behind for the, for the larva is a much more palatable uh, substance that it has the enzymes to digest. And they break down that very quickly. So that's one of the miracles of nature working well together. Funguses, between fungus and uh, insects, they really are the partnerships that run the world. Well, when you start getting that wood broken down a little bit, it becomes, um, first of all, the, the woodpeckers are going to want to eat it, but it also makes it a little more manageable for them. They like it about two years old, makes it more manageable for them to then uh, come in and make their cavity nest, excavate cavity nest. So in addition to plant material at the beginning and at the end, um, insect larvae can also digest flesh, which we don't like to think about, but well, maybe you do. Right. So they digest flesh. And so they have very specific mandibles and they have a lot of um, compounds. I don't think it's saliva if it's from a maggot. I don't know, but let's just say it's saliva and be done with it. And so uh, they were before uh, antibiotics and they now are again um, professional wound cleaners and they will eat only the dead tissue and the, whatever enzymes they have in their saliva promotes new skin growth, which if I'm desperate enough, I suppose I'll do it, but not just yet. Another, so there's, so with the miracles of evolution, there are a whole lot of them. Um, I've, I've missed one already. They, um, they're part of trophic, they're, they keep the trophic conveyor belt going. And then they invented whole industries and a lot of their products and byproducts are exploited by humans. So I thought we'd take a little look at that. They are the world's garbage men. Dung beetles are on every continent except Antarctica and they have all sorts of different, you could do a whole program on dung beetles, but we're just gonna touch uh, quickly on all of these. Uh, they're, they're rollers, tunnelers, dwellers. Um, they, they're just, they're there to pick up and make, take those nutrients and recycle those nutrients back into the soil. Another quick little aside here. So Australia, Terra Nullius, of course, the land where the empty land where only, of course, the residents of 60,000 years live, but we pay no attention to that. And the English brought in uh, cattle and they brought in sheep. Well, of the 250 domestic species of dung beetle, they were accustomed to the droppings of, of arid grass dwellers who, who left like 
maybe like we've all seen gopher tortoise poo. Well, that's what they were used to dealing with. They weren't used to dealing with this slop that came out of the far end of a cow. And so there was nothing, there was no species of dung beetle in Australia that could manage it. And so pretty soon they were knee deep in cow dung, which was the, the uh, origin of the famous Australian fly. So the flies could could use that for uh, for uh, laying their eggs and breeding. So it was quite a disaster. They did eventually find some African species that could do the job for them. So insects originated manufacturing. All of these things could take a whole story to tell. That creating cellulose from um, creating the paper from wood cellulose, and then also uh, constructing these forms, the very elegant invented agriculture. So uh, ants and termites uh, do uh, farm fungus, which they uh, feed to their young and they feed, they feed the fungus, uh, they chew up some uh, leaf litter so the fungus can absorb the carbon. So this is a wonderful uh, recycling. Animal husbandry, they herd aphids. They push them all together so they can concentrate the resource and collect. They basically aphid poo is their honeydew. They do a number of other things that uh, humans uh, use insects in these products and processes and of course we think of um, honey, but there's a lot more than that. So the oak gall wasp, and again, you can see how tiny there are, these tiny little uh, wasps. Um, so they lay the egg, and then they, in an attempt to protect itself, the oak will create this gall around the egg, and then the, the, the wasp will cycle through it's life till it emerges as an adult. They can also be parasitized, but that's not to go into. But uh, the oak gall wasp ink is what made the ink for these documents uh, permanent. Before that ink was not particularly permanent. Uh, I don't know if any of you have noticed, I've been seeing more oak gall wasps this year than usual. I, I, maybe I'm just looking for them more, or maybe they're just uh, there's a bump of crop. I'm not sure. Well, silk, there's another one. There are, of course, no uh, silk worm moths left in the wild. They're all under cultivation. Um, the, each cocoon produces about a mile of silk thread, but to harvest that, once the, once the uh, larvae uh, complete the cocoon, then they're boiled. Of course, they keep enough growing to uh, to keep the manufacturer going, but they're steamed or boiled so that they don't chew their way out and destroy that mile of silk thread. Um, okay. If somebody, somebody is trying to, who can see what you can share? Um, there we go. So all that red and everything we have, this is a scale bug, the cochineal. It takes about 70 pounds of scale bug to produce a pound of red dye. It's really beautiful. Uh, it's presented here as a rare beetle, but it is not, but it's in all sorts of food stuff, uh, makeup, used as a dye. Shellac, there's actually a lac bug uh, different locations produce different colors, but the, uh, the female uh, pr uh, produces this lac and covers herself with it uh, when she lays her eggs, and then she, she dies that the eggs are protected. So I think it's Thailand where they have a whole lac factory. The so lac is pretty darn important. It shows up in all sorts of foodstuffs and medication, back to the beautiful lipstick and mascara, and of course, uh, shellac used for furniture and fine musical instruments. And this is uh, probably the first thing that came to mind is that insects pollinate plants, which of course they do for themselves, they don't do for us. 
So they do, as they go around, they pollinate plants. This is a nice little uh, saddlebag here. Uh, some, some bees keep the, the pollen under their abdomen, but most have these little, uh, little baskets. We think of uh, the European honeybee. You think of bees. You think very often of uh, colonies of bees, which we're going to talk about in a minute. This is uh, not native. Um, there's a whole discussion about bees that we'll have another time. Um, but bees produce all sorts of wonderful uh, products: honey, of course, royal jelly, the pollens, propolis, venom, beeswax all of which are, are monetized. Um, claims are made about royal jelly, eternal use or longevity. And so that's always it's the idea that the bees are, bees are, are they are colonies and, and they produce the honey. But in fact, the vast majority, the vast, vast majority of species, of bee species, are solitary. Indeed, the only bees that are colonial are the, the honeybees and bumblebees. The rest uh, are solitary, like the bee cutter, leaf cutter bee, and so they have to make, they can uh, make it in, in wood, in dead grasses, they can be minor bees, they can be everywhere, these kinds of bees. Now, I was trying to describe this part of this program to somebody and I said, well, you know, if you are a solitary bee, it is the equivalent of being a young woman with maybe a high school education, a minimum wage job, two preschool kids, and no car. It's like you just can't get a break. So the, the difficulty for these bees, the, the females, is that when they have to go forage, they're leaving their uh, their eggs, their young, their their um, their nest unprotected. So it's very uh, very uh, what's the term? Parlous. It is not an easy life. The orchid bee, by the way, is new, fairly new. It's Mexican. Uh, it's a beautiful bee. If you see it, the males have huge, big um, saddlebags on their tibia. So the colonial bees we have are the honeybee and the bumblebee. And this brings us to eusociality, which is, as I say, confounded Darwin because all of, he didn't know genetics. They hadn't really been uh, discovered, although they had been discovered, but not uh, disseminated. Mendel's work was kept hidden. But cooperative superorganisms. So, what is a eusocial organism? It's not just a ton of the same creatures living together. Um, it talks about the eusociality, the power of colonies. Now, 10% of bees are eusocial, all ants, all termites, and 10% of wasps. So, what does it mean to be eusocial? Well, it's characterized by extreme altruism of the individual. They will happily die for each other, because, and readily so, because the gene, the gene pool isn't being changed by the death of one particular individual. The species will continue. Reproduction, uh, reproductive division, which means there are only a few, one, or in the case of termites, maybe two breeders, within a community overlapping generations, cooperative care of the young, and defense of the nest. So you social insects all have home territory. They're not sort of wandering. So to do all those things, they need to communicate. Well, if you don't have um, uh, voice parts, and you don't have, uh, so how, well, the question is, how do they do it? All insects communicate through mate, for mating purposes, and they can do it a number of different ways. They can do it through pheromones, like this fabulous fancy pants wasp. He is picking up, those antenna are picking up chemical signals from an available female. 
And so he can feel, smell, see, touch. He just, this is how he's getting all, all his information is from pheromones. Another way is to do it through sound and vibration. Now the cricket rubs its wings together and then this is stridulation and the grasshopper rubs its hind legs against the wings which I always thought they were rubbing their hind legs together. And you can see where their ears, so where to the extent that they're picking up um, the sound, they're picking it up. It's not part of the, the senses in the head. And the, um, the ears are at the base of the abdomen, in the, right up here in the grasshopper. Uh, cicadas do it something differently. They have washboard abs connected to very thin strips of muscle and they actually vibrate their um it says abdominal timbles and i've read it also it's tympanic uh, but it really is like a washboard and they can be truly deafening in florida we have all of our i think it's 13 different species of cicadas and they're all uh, cyclical cicadas, but we have so many that we always have a cicada. Just some years they're louder than others it's because some years the loud ones have emerged. So, uh, but if you're a pollinator, you've got, a, and you've got, so if you're, if you're a pollinator and you're a bee and you found a really great source of pollen and nectar, you're going to want to explain that to your friends. And this is the famous waggle dance. So the bee finds the food and returns to the hive. And she, based on the direction of the sun and how good the source is and how far away it is, uh, does a waggle dance. And it's quite uh, complex. The, the, the longer the, the dance, the longer the distance the dance covers, the farther away it is. And then how wide her waggles are, she comes back that she's describing um, the, the plentifulness of the food source. And that's it where it says the more plentiful, the longer it lasts. And so the, the hive can find uh, the rest of the food. So those are some pretty basic ones. But there are others where it gets a little more complicated within the hive. And this is, so all of the bee, all of the workers, the larvae and the queen are giving off different pheromones. And this is the key here. The queen is the Xanax in the hive. She has a, a compound called a 2MP, queen mandibular pheromone. And she produces that at a constant rate. And uh, the worker bees, rub against her or they sense it in there and that it calms them. And so she is not controlling the hive through whips and chains. She's doing it by sending out a complex a chemical signal saying all is right with the world. Now these simple chemical compounds are on the body of insects to prevent desiccation. So they're very simple. But it's like alphabets. You have an alphabet, the letter A is simple, B is simple. But by the time you've got how 26 letters, you can write masterpieces. Well, that's how it works with the, with the bees. They use those simple mixtures, um, the, the complex mixtures of simple compounds. Did I say that right? Complex mixtures. Yes, I did get it right. And so they send a variety of signals. And that's how they get the, the, the um, and that's how they get to the first set of jobs they have. So before you ever see a bee out in the world, uh, she has gone through a lot. So she's been laid as an egg. Then the worker bee will feed her once it hatches. And then once the larva feed uh, full growth, another worker will seal the cell. When the larva becomes a pupa and then emerges an adult, her first job is to clean up her own bedroom. She doesn't get a minute to spare. And then these are the worker bee jobs. And so the, the bees will be in the, in the hive for approximately 21 days. Of course, conditions always vary. 
but she goes through all these the undertaker they take out dead dead uh bees she will be a nurse she'll attend the queen she'll make honey she'll make wax uh she'll do all of those things and then she'll be promoted to guard bee and then to forager and we'll take a look through those things so when you've got a healthy uh, set of bees, and these are not commercial honeybees. These are bees that are going out foraging different locations, different harvests. Um, and this is really going to produce a healthy crop of worker bees. And this is, we won't dwell on this, but this is an example of how each crop produces a different color of pollen. Compared to the commercial honeybees that are uh, sent out to pollinate a monoculture. Uh, these are bees that are uh, not healthy, colony collapse disorder. If you're a bee and you're very clean and you will not defecate in the hive um, and you're traveling 3,000 miles across the country to go see some almonds, you're going to be some stress by the time you get there. So the, the feral bees are doing a lot better than the commercial bees. So when you've gone through all the nurse, the undertaker, um, the wax maker, all of these different things, then the final promotion before foraging is to be a guard bee. And the guard bee sits at the entrance to the hive, and she sits on four of her six legs, and, the and she can see that she has her, she brings her wings out. They're not behind her, like here, these wings are, wings are brought out and forward, and she is going to test this incoming bee for the right complex chemical signal before she will allow that bee in the hive. And if it's the wrong bee coming into the wrong hive, that's a dead bee. So the guard bees um, are protecting the hive. This is really important. And once they've uh, finished that duty, then they become a forager. So the foraging bees we see um, are the most bonded to the hive. Uh, they're the ones that are the most expendable uh, because there are so many of them. Um, and they've learned how to go, about, uh, go out and come back. And when they come back, they're coming in and being checked by the guard bees. All of this requires this constant combination of chemicals. So here we have the queen, and here she is. You can see she's a little bigger. She's got the queen mandibular pheromone, and things are going really well until they stop going well. And that's when um, there are a number of reasons they can change this, but uh, when the queen is no longer serving their purpose, they, the uh, worker bees give her the death cuddle. They uh, cuddle around her and overheat her to death. So that is something that they have to agree to do. Meanwhile, they're making ready for new queens. Uh, these are special little uh, cells. They're different than the, the, the worker uh, bee cells. And the queen, the, they'll often make several at a time, and then the queens, the new queens have to do it out. But they give the queen only royal jelly. And it was thought that this is what made them queens. Well, it's now been determined that it is the uh, restriction of pollen that turns into queens. That it's, there's, a, there's a kind of governing um, factor in the pollen. Well, however it works out, uh, they get themselves a new queen and, and that works well. And sometimes the queen's fine, the hive just gets overcrowded and so they make a new queen and the old queen takes off with about half of the hive. And by the way, this is when the, the bee is absolutely not going to sing you because it doesn't have a, a, a hive to protect. This is the homeless bee. And of course, we've all, or maybe we haven't, um, a honeybee democracy, the bees then send out uh, scouts to find a new location and they come back in between them they decide which is going to be their new home. So all of this requires complex communication through chemical signaling. And then just to, uh, this, uh, I'm not sure what the time is, but to finish up, how successful is this system? Well, here's 
a good example. So termites, you can see they have many more, um, more like ants, where they have very many different body types with the bees have the queen, the drones, and the workers. Um, termites have many more different body parts. Isoptera and all termites are eusocial. And about a year ago in Brazil, in the dry uplands of Brazil, they found a termite mound the size of Great Britain. So that's a thousand miles from stem to stem. And they know, and you can now, if we had a classroom here, I would say, how do they know that it's a single colony, a single community with a number of different mounds? If they take a termite from Land's End and they take it a thousand miles to symbolically John O'Groats in the north of Scotland, they drop the termite in. The guard termites are going to check for the right chemical signal and accept it if it belongs to the same colony. And the, this thousand mile colony is a single colony because the, the termites are accepted from one to the other end. So that basically, uh, it doesn't begin to do justice, but it just scratches the surface of, um, of how amazing insects are. And this is a little introduction to uh, what I hope to get done in the summer part two. We've seen this, the insects decline. Humans and extinctions go hand in hand. The, uh, the background rate of extinction has been um, far exceeded. Extinction occurs naturally, but as you can see, it's really the human population and extinction. So we're destroying, the, we're destroying and fragmenting the habitat. We're using all sorts of chemicals that disrupt um, the ability of, of insects to communicate. The temperature is warming up. Um, and so the percentage of decline in global insects is catastrophic. And of course, since we now know that birds um, require insects, not all of these, but birds require um, a lot of insects to thrive. I mean, it's all interconnected. You cannot, cannot have insects go down, expect everything else to flourish. So this is just over the last decade. Uh, some of these might be a year old, some of these charts, but nothing is really much older. So here's the thing that um, I'm waiting for an update on this. So what is the causes? Well, obviously monoculture, pesticides, and fertilizer uh, is, is not helping at all. But climate change listed at 5%, and this is, absolutely has to change because we all have thresholds and tolerances and so with the, the intensity of the changes that we're undergoing, that might very well be within the threshold of the species or the species might be able to move for a little bit, but the, uh, the habitat that supports that species can't move with it. Um, one of the saddest stories is the uh, Oyamel in Michoacan where the villagers were told, you know, the monarch butterflies need this, this particular range uh, for their overwintering land. So you, by all means, go ahead and harvest above that. And of course, with climate change, the insects want to go up. And there is no up. There's no forest for them. So this, this may change um, in, a, in a cascade, or it may change slowly, but it's going to change for sure. And so if this is a really good book, this extraordinary insect, um, there's a there's another title to this book. One is the English uh, 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 printed version. The other, I think, bite buzz sting is the American one. But it's the same book, and I know this because I ended up buying both of them, thinking they were two different books. This uh, extraordinary insect. This is Norwegian forest biologist. This is a really great source of a lot of information. Which brings us to kind of wrapping up. So um, I'm going to see if there are any questions. I see there are 10 things in the chat room. I don't know. Um, so what would you like me to do in terms of sharing my screen or not share? Should I pause? I'll stop yeah, sharing and we can talk.
you can go ahead and pause sharing. Anybody there we go. Um, that has questions, I was saying earlier, go ahead and post those now. You could also unmute yourselves. And um, I started off with some with a question, two questions. Uh, the first one was that I noticed that the, the solitary bees seem to have more vibrant coloring. And I was wondering if there was a reason for that. The reason could be that those are the prettiest pictures and I liked them. <laughs> then probably not all solitary bees. There's a solitary bee that comes around our pollinator garden that is about the size of the tip of a matchstick tiny and it's yellow and it just it, it darts around so they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes okay and then the other one i half jokingly but actually kind of serious are there any native dung beetles to the southeast region I oh sure sure hard. oh yes yeah, they're everywhere if they weren't everywhere we would be knee deep in poop oh, that's and so um yeah the 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 breakdown of um oh senior moment what do raptors eat carrion carrion um so for the for the vegetation we've got the insects do a really good job uh for carrion the birds do a really good job and for uh species more insects do a good job but you can't mess with any of it there's a, a an infamous story from India, diclofenac is an anti-inflammatory and it was given because the Hindus are uh, vegetarian, but they have cows for dairy. But when they would die, it was part of they would recognize uh, the cycle of nature, whatever. They'd let the dead cow lie there and, the, and the, the vultures would come and eat it. Well, they fed these animals diclofenac to improve their it's like feeding chickens antibiotics. It's like this crazy thing. Well, anyway, concentrated in the liver of these dead cows and the cows and the, and the and vultures, first thing they do is they rip in and they eat the liver, which of course killed all the vultures. So we had in the, in the country of India, they lost their vultures, which meant that, you know, the rabid dogs and I mean, it was just it was I don't think they actually got plagued, but it was it was very, very bad. So even the non charismatic creatures, although I happen to like black vultures, even the non charismatic creatures, if they're here, they're playing a role or else they couldn't be here. I, I enjoyed this very much personally. I learned a whole bunch. I had no idea. Um, well, and now you can see what I couldn't possibly, Aaron, I couldn't possibly start talking about how insects are in trouble unless you knew what insects did in the first place. Yeah, we're going to have to have a part two. <laughs> well, we're going to work on it over the summer. That's when I go to Maine in the summer. I um, That is my time off. So. Um, so where, was, because, where was the um the location of that termite mound where was that I'm brazil sure. brazil brazil fascinating yeah that was uh that made that was uh okay so this is yeah difficult to hear because everybody here okay i guess anyway and and um the what was it the larval forget what insect it was, but the, the larval that was placed inside of wood with the fungus around it. Oh, yeah. Well, see, what? and here's, yeah, this is, so here's what's interesting. Um, but it's not interesting. Here's what's terrible. So beetles, let's just say 100 years ago and leave it at that. So beetles would be able to sense volatile organic compounds that a tree was stressed. And so they would they would sort of drill a little hole and they would lay their eggs in that stress tree, which would then get eaten up by the the larvae with the help of the fungus. And then in due course, that tree would come down, and that would open up the canopy and get undergrowth, and it would be just fine. So climate change has happened, 
which and two things have occurred all the trees in the forest are stressed without exception they're all stressed and instead of having a population of beetles that would you know you'd so in the spring you'd have like a hundred and then it'd be a thousand then it'd be ten thousand then it'd be a million and then winter would come and you go back to so there'd be this break that would so the, the beetles would either die off or go into diapause, which is beetle insect hibernation. So now there's no diapause whatsoever. So the population of wood boring, bark, bear, bark boring beetles is totally astronomically out of control. And all of the trees and forests, particularly the, uh, the pine forests of the Northwest and the Big Apple Tier are dead. So that's sad. Um, I, try, I try to usually end on an up note, but uh, the up note is I think just, uh, what's it? Okay, Aaron, help me here. Find me an up note to end on. <laughs> I, how about what is, your, what is your favorite insect? Oh. I like a good beetle. I really do like a good beetle. Although, unlike Darwin, I would never pop one in my mouth. <laughs> and there's, if you haven't seen it, uh, there's a really wonderful, it's, it's yay big. I, I don't you know. Well, I, I can't go look in my library now. But it's called the Beetles of Eastern North America. And it is, it's like, I could just sit there looking through the pages and beetles are, Beetles are pretty amazing. Um, I think beetles. You think it would be butterflies, wouldn't you? But no, I think it's beetles. Well, that'll have to program, I guess. I think sorry, Tom. That will have to be another program. There you go. There you go. So this one, this one was great, though. Really learned a lot. So great oh. program. Yeah, you know really and. As just, I'm not an entomologist, but I do, if any of you know her, Brooke Elias is, my friend Brooke is an entomologist. And so um, I put the program together and ran it by her. And so I was, felt very confident that I had misdirected. The one place she corrected me was about um, the parasitic wasps and how they operate. I had the wrong visual for that. No, this is great, and it's now 8.16, so I think I've earned my glass of wine, and um, I'm happy to, you know, I'm happy to do this. It's, um, it's a lot easier than slogging through scrub habitat at 85 degrees and 90% humidity. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. So we'll see you sometime next year. Part two. Yes, I look Thank forward so to it. Much. Looking forward to it. <laughs> all right. Thank Thanks, you all everybody. For... Enjoy the rest of the evening. Good night. Thank you Thank so, you so much. much, Kate. Thank Good you night, for everyone. being here. Good Don't night, forget, everyone. Uh, if you have the uh, field trip this weekend, I hope you have a blast. And um, yeah, we'll see you soon. All right. Always keep in touch. Check out the website for upcoming events. and. Uh, Feel free to drop us a line on the email if you have any questions or comments. Okay. Bye, Thank guys. You. Thanks a lot. Bye, everybody. That was awesome, Aaron. Thank you. Bye-bye.